I don't know how people will look back on this video, but I believe this might be the most important video I've released so far in my nine years of What If Altist. I know that What If Altist is more of a history channel than a philosophy one, and earlier in my career I said I actively disliked philosophy, and at the time I was judging it purely off bad philosophy. I've just come out of a difficult period of my life where I moved across the country again, lost a lot of my best friends, and had to rethink over previous parts of my life. And I've come out of it happier and stronger, but I know a lot of other folks are going through rough times, so I wanted to make a video to help them out. People often pontificate about how the meaning of life is unknowable. I think in a lot of ways that's true, because life's always a mystery. We all walk our own roads and are born with wildly different circumstances, thus creating wildly different outcomes. However, I think our society is inherently cowardly and shrinks away from difficult questions of meaning or mortality. Many people are going to call me arrogant for even attempting this question, but as my dad used to say, if nobody in the room is doing the right thing, that means it's your job. Our age is quietly dying from an inability to deal with our own mortality and meaning, which is incredibly ironic, and I don't pretend to develop a new truth here, but I'm going to give this a shot. I think the real short answer for the meaning of life is simple. It's to face death properly. This is a video to explain the role of mortality in life. Through this video, you will see the history of the world and society today through a different lens, and also see the crushing crisis that will kill modernity soon and is eating our society alive. As you're going to see, by looking into the riddle of death, everything else makes sense. While we all have to deal with death, we shouldn't let the anxiety of it or the world consume us. Our sponsor here is to help keep you busy with a sweet two-in-one combination of devices. Power Up Paradise is a phone case featuring a Game Boy on its back. That's right, your phone can now have a fully functional Game Boy attached to it, capable of playing all your favorite childhood games. Each Game Boy phone case is carefully crafted with high-quality materials to ensure that they can withstand the wear and tear of daily use. Every detail from the placement of the buttons to the texture of the case create a product that not only looks great, but also feels great in your hand. And their customer service is excellent, so if you have any issues, their team will be there to help you out. The Game Boy case is a great product, and for my fans, Power Up Paradise is offering a discount for anyone who uses the code what if five at checkout? This is a really good deal, so check out the link in the description and get your new phone case today. You are going to die. Do you need me to repeat that? You're still gonna die. How about again? No matter what you possibly do, you will die. On top of that, you cannot fundamentally control how, where, or when you die. For all of you, you could die in an hour and be completely unable to do anything about it. The funny thing is that everyone in the audience knows that to be true, but me bringing it up repeatedly probably caused large numbers of you immense discomfort. Talking about death is one of the most impolite subjects in society. Kind of like talking about religion, race, or who in the room you've slept with. When was the last time you and the homies, or even in a university philosophy classroom, have really talked about death? An incredibly ironic example of this is that in an earlier version of this video that I uploaded to YouTube, it was age-restricted, meaning YouTube doesn't want people under the age of 18 to watch it. And doesn't that just so perfectly prove the point I'm making? And I don't know if this version's age-restricted. A couple things got me to make this video. The first is I was listening to Dan Carlin's podcast in World War I, and the sheer courage and fearlessness of death that the soldiers in that war had was unbelievable to me today. The trenches of World War I were the closest thing to hell that the human race has produced, with rats, disease, rotting bodies, and shells turning beautiful European countryside into a wasteland reminiscent of the moon. In single battles like Verdun, the Brushilov Offensive, or the Somme, millions of people died. Again, most of the boys who died at these battles were 20-year-old virgins who were willing to give everything to their nations and ideals. Many of the upper and middle class ones lived lives significantly more comfortable than ours today. Then I compare that to the people I went to high school and college with. I know lots of people who have legitimate mental health breakdowns for the most trivial things. 
One of my relatives is 15, and when I was visiting him, I asked if he wanted to stay at my Airbnb overnight since I had an extra room, and it took him half an hour to work himself up to do it since he viewed it as a big risk. And he wasn't ready for it, and then after we drove 15 minutes to my place, he only wanted to stay another 15 minutes at my Airbnb since he was too anxious. I once went on a high school trip and the other kids refused to eat any vegetables, and even when we had shared dishes, they'd pick the meat out for themselves and leave the vegetables for the rest of the group. In dating today with young girls, it's too much commitment to ask them to go on a date straight, or even to ask them if they like you. You invite them to hang out, sleep with them, and then drag it out until what we call a situationship occurs, since everyone involved is too anxious to be adults and commit to a real relationship, which, need I remind you, can be canceled at any time. Our society has done something very, very wrong if our ancestors only a hundred years ago were able to face the horrors of the trenches at the same age and were incapable of functioning with even the slightest amount of stress. I've had three near-death experiences myself. The first was when I nearly self-deleted at age 16. The second is when a flying branch was seconds from breaking my neck on the Appalachian Trail. And the third is when I went on a shamanic spirit quest and went to hell and thought I had already died. This sounds really edgy, but death makes the world so much more beautiful. When you pull yourself out and realize that you're still alive, the world looks much, much brighter. The sky is blue or the flowers smell better and music sounds much more beautiful. The tension of life and death is better than any drug and feels like heroin. The adrenaline pumping in your veins makes your body tingle all over with excitement. Just talking about it brings a smile to my face. This video in many ways feels liberating for me to write since these are things that you can't talk about at all in polite conversation. When I lived in France, I'd go to the local Irish pub, and there was a French Foreign Legion encampment nearby, so I heard their stories about the colonial wars that France still fights today, notably in Mali for them. First of all, that's a much bigger and bloodier war than anyone gives it credit for, which isn't hard since no one's heard of it, and lots of them had horror stories, but they all said the same stuff that I did about death, that being close to it's terrible, but also the most exhilarating and profound experience a person can have. The truth is built off paradox. Everything's its own thing, but it's also the opposite at the same time. There's nothing worse than death, but there's also nothing better than death. That's where we'll start with the riddle of death. This video pulls a lot from the book The Worm at the Core by Sheldon Solomon, which is one of the best philosophy books I've ever read, and introduced me to this theory about how death drives everything in life. I'd highly recommend it, and it's a shorter read, around 200 pages. The only way you can understand anything is through its boundaries. It's arguable if Russia or Brazil are part of Western civilization, but you know what's not arguable? That China and Iraq are not part of Western civilization. You only know something really exists once you see it not existing somewhere else. We never thought how special it is to have air to breathe until we entered outer space and saw how rare it is in the cosmos. Even today, most people take for granted having breathable air since we've never had to not deal with it. Life has meaning since it's finite. Look at how we treat everything that's not finite for granted. In Western European cultures, we take water for granted, while other cultures will fight tooth and nail for it. Life is finite to consciousness itself, thus it gives our lives as individuals meaning since it creates a boundary for our own existence. Without death, you would not exist. The only reason you existed at all is that your ancestors died and felt compelled to create you to replace them. The cycle never starts without death in the first place. People often ask why we should die. However, the reality is that life cannot exist without death. Without the time pressure created by death, there is simply no impetus to push for life in the first place. If they were completely assured of their own existence, the first cells would have no reason to put the effort into making life in the first place. We can see this in that the only immortal beings in the universe are tiny cells that don't do much because they have no pressure to do so. This is a mental concept modernity really struggles with. In order for something to exist, there also must be its opposite. With the creation of mental processes that allow good judgment, it must also allow evil judgment. Man cannot exist without woman. The day needs night, love needs hate. Without that duality, nothing exists, only the chaotic void. This is the yin and yang that so many cultures talk about. To push this point even further, the trinity is a manifestation of how this duality creates new stuff. Man and woman makes a child, the day and night makes a new day, buying and selling makes the stock market, war and peace makes the nation an empire. 
This is why the Trinity is such an important concept in major religions, and why people are willing to fight and die over the concept. We laugh at pre-modern peoples dying over religion, but they were dying over what they viewed to be the basic nature of the cosmos while we'll fight over an economic system, which is more shallow. There are two symbols that are good to contextualize death with. The first is the one taken from the book, The Worm at the Core. Inside the apple that are our lives, there is a worm that will devour us from inside no matter what we do. We do have lives, but gradually or not, the worm eats us alive. The second is the worm Ouroboros, better known to most people from its Norse mythological equivalent as Jormungandr or the Midgard Serpent. This is the snake that eats its own tail. In Norse myth, the serpent Jormungandr was explicitly the symbol for death, and that mortality creates life but also kills it only to restart the process of creation and destruction that goes on forever. This is a very useful and common symbol, and in Indian mythology, it's also why Shiva is the god of creativity and destruction at the same time. In every culture in the world, the divine feminine is the symbol for both creativity and destruction that are two sides of the same coin. This is why your genes make you want to impregnate that hot girl with a horrible personality that will make you miserable, because she has a better immune system, that means that your descendants in a hundred years have a higher chance of surviving the plague. This is why our genes often select us for degeneracy and lusts and other desires. Well, mystics and the wisest people in the world have told us for all of history that to humble ourselves and be content is what will make us happy. Because the guy who has five children through five baby mamas passed on his genes, well, the sage who achieved enlightenment and true happiness died childless. I believe the story of Adam and Eve really happened, although maybe not in the way we expected it to have. Animals have no knowledge of death. A wild dog has a life of drinking water from streams, living naked, and no medicine to deal with any of its illnesses. However, almost any dog you see is happier than almost any human. Dogs are unaware of their own deaths, and as we understand it, no animal has knowledge of their own mortality. Animals exist in the Garden of Eden, or their lives belong to God, in that they are not conscious of their place in the world, and thus are judged for the things they were biologically programmed to do, without their own individual judgment weighing them down. The animals feel happy since they just act with what their nature demands in that moment. Around 70,000 years ago, humans had a breakthrough called the Cognitive Revolution. After that point, we started having culture, religion, large technological revolutions, and discovered the idea of the abstract idea. Beforehand, humans had the same physical makeup as today and neurological structures, but they lacked the ability to see abstract concepts. 70,000 years ago also was not a good time in our history. The supervolcano Toba in Indonesia had erupted, creating a ice age that made us a critically endangered species with only 6,000 humans left on the planet. What came after might have corresponded pretty closely to the Bible. There's the stoned ape theory in that psychedelics radically increase trait openness, or the ability to think about abstract ideas. It would fit the biblical narrative of a group of humans overdosed on mushrooms or ayahuasca, or the fruit of knowledge in order to survive the crisis and later learned about life, death, and abstract ideas. We left God's garden when we learned about our own deaths and the realm of ideas, which in this biblical worldview belongs to God. Thus, the most traumatic event in history happened. It supports my thesis that with the awareness of death came the cultural breakthrough in which humans developed religions, cultural differences, technological progress, and more. This is how humans were able to colonize the whole world and drive every other species of hominid extinct. It's interesting to look at the various innovations that came out of the cognitive revolution because they're really the strategies humans use to deal with death. Let me go through them. The first is culture and ethnicity. We subliminate ourselves into a shared culture as a way of feeling like we belong to something bigger. If I know the American nation will continue the way of life I belong to longer than I live, that'll put me at ease. This is also a genetic strategy in that nations traditionally have shared genetics, and so, say, if you're dying for your nation, genes that you share with other people will survive even if you as an individual die. People use national symbols and myths to create a shared national cult that also survives before and after death. This leads to the second strategy, that being art. Beauty can last forever, or at least very long amounts of time. 
The most beautiful thing I've seen in the whole world during my life is Hagia Sophia, which was built 1600 years ago. The people who were building it, I'm sure knew that they were making the most beautiful thing in the world, and I bet every single one of them would be happy if they thought we still believed that nearly 2000 years later. Every artist wants to make something beautiful and true that will last longer than their lifetime. It would make me the happiest man in the world if I realized people still watch these videos centuries from now. If the nation allows your genes and culture to survive, art allows your soul, personality, and essence to do so. Speaking of Hagia Sophia, the third strategy is religion. Religion obviously gives an afterlife, or the idea that the soul lives on after death. Humans by all accounts need to believe in an afterlife since we're the only society ever in history not to have one. The afterlife doesn't even need to be nice. Most pre-axial age ones weren't. However, every agnostic society ever in history has failed, either by falling to totalitarianism or hedonism, and so religion by all accounts is necessary for humans to have a functioning society. Religion also increases awareness of our connectedness with the universe. We're not individuals, but little pieces of a web of existence, being part of families, nations, ecosystems, and eras of history. Studies have found the thing that makes people happiest is interpersonal relationships and connections. Once people realize they're part of something bigger, which religion supplies, they can feel like death's not so scary since everyone's going to be all right without them and many of the things they loved about themselves will survive past their deaths. In Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal, he makes the interesting point that religion is a rebellion against our genes. Our genes naturally design us to be competitive, cruel, petty, and lustful, since those are strategies that help spread our genes in low-trust environments like the wild. Religions are group agreements on the part of society to make choices to make life more bearable. Take Christianity, where in the Roman Empire at the time, one third of the population were slaves with no rights. There were several tyrannical, cruel, and perverse god kings who ruled with impunity. Women were treated as second-class citizens, and Rome held its boot on most of the known world. Christ arrived and said it didn't have to be that way, and if we all tried to love each other, things could get better, and they gradually did. Buddhism asks us not to enslave ourselves to our own biological desires which benefit our genes, while instead calming our minds so we don't have to live our lives solely through our desires. The most obvious strategy to survive death is having family and children. This is since your child is literally half you, and since half of a personality is genetic, you'll see traits of yourself in your kids. If you have four kids, you've doubled the Eunice in the world. Look at how Genghis Khan literally fathered both Tamerlane and the Mughal Empire. When you make a family, you make a group of people genetically designed to irrationally care about you, thus making the pain of life easier to bear, and you know that when you pass, you'll be missed and live on through their memories. As I talk about in these videos, we are the society in all of history which cares about family the least. In basically every other era of history, with a few exceptions, family was the most important thing in someone's life. And you can see that in the top predictor for revolutions and political crises is when people can't afford to have children. Sexless young men are another great predictor. This is since once reproduction is not secured, people go crazy and lose perspective on everything else. We were designed to breed first and be rational later. In many cultures of the world, like the Egyptian or Indian peasants, nothing in their lives were secure except reproduction in the family, and those societies have gone on stably for thousands of years. In most cultures in history, someone's social status among the common people was determined not by their wealth, but by how many children they had and how many they could support. Which is why the patriarchs of the Bible brag about how many children they have. Hell, in this video I talk about how family structure is the biggest factor behind political systems. You can almost perfectly predict political ideologies across the 20th century based off what family structures a society has. Possibly the greatest student of mythology in the last century, Joseph Campbell, talked about how in most mythic traditions, life is viewed as a game by the gods. This is the best explanation I've ever seen. Life is painful and beautiful, lovely and horrible and goes through so many bizarre dreams, whether nine-foot scorpions, the long-necked dinosaurs, Stalinist Russia, the pyramids, L'Ancien Regime France, and everything else. Life is a series of absurd dreams that we all collectively agree are reality. The universe seems to have little interest in what our personal desires are, but does everything it can to make life interesting and like nothing that came before or we could possibly imagine. Emperor Augustus on his deathbed said one of my favorite lines ever in history with, Have I played my part well? This line always sticks with me since due to the absurdity of life. 
Augustus was a Republican in his youth from a small town and at a young age was forced by circumstances to become military dictator of the known world. He viewed the population he ruled with a combination of contempt and love. Circumstances forced him into bizarre actions, and that's true for all of us. I play the role of a YouTube historian in my life, and I spend most of my waking hours wearing that mask in some form. However, I never thought this would be my life. This wasn't a job 10 years ago, and my worldview in high school was pretty bleak while everyone was telling me I had to go to college and live in a corporate world. I'm thankful for this, but I also view it with some humor. In most other lives, I'd be a peasant, maybe a Bengali prostitute, maybe a medieval nobleman. We all play parts we can't control. You can either feel the complete horror of death rush upon you, or accept it and have some fun along the way. People who are stuck up smug and not fun are people where the pain of life is too heavy for them, and thus they hold themselves behind rigid patterns and their status, and thus trying to break that apart terrifies them, since it shows them mortality and how chaotic the world is. I can't deal with people who don't have senses of humor, and a sense of status and recognition by being respected by the group makes death easier to deal with. If your community tells you that your life is worthwhile, it allows you to believe that your life is worthwhile. However, the negative side of this is that humiliating and degrading others often increases someone's self-estimation by implicitly moving themselves up the status hierarchy. The joy in life comes from playing a role with some pageantry and silliness thrown in. There's a book called Homo Ludens saying humans are fundamentally players and jokers, and I agree. People get identity from fulfilling their roles. Having fun and games makes life worth living. Life is hard and death is scary, and we like the people who can bring some joy into it. In the scariest and most dangerous parts of life, we also like pageantry. People dress up for war and love and develop rituals for dealing with the scariest parts of the universe or religion. This is the origin of culture, rituals, and symbols. One of the most beautiful things about death which Marcus Aurelius said is that it's an equalizer. The only similarity between a slave in the fields and Alexander is that they both die. From their deaths, you can judge their lives equally in some ways. One of the beautiful things about death is that I gave a bunch of different ways you can try to beat death and get some immortality, and it doesn't matter which one you pick as long as if you're satisfied with how well you did. For a second, just imagine how unbearable a society would be if the rich lived forever and the poor did not. And that is why death is an equalizer. One of the ways to deal with death is just to accept it and laugh along. Think of how the brave 300 who faced the Persian army, Socrates willingly drinking hemlock poison that killed himself, or Jesus dying on the cross. We rightly make these figures the heights of heroism and remember their stories. Jordan Peterson in his book Maps of Meaning, which I think is by far his best and most profound, although it's pretty long, talks about the four strategies humans use to deal with death. There are three incorrect ways, those being totalitarianism, hedonism, and nihilism, and one correct, that being heroism. All the negative strategies are necessary in moderation, but when used to fill the whole of life turn cancerous. Totalitarianism stems from being so terrified of death that you give the group complete control over your life. Political radicalism is a cancer that expands over your soul that prevents you from actually seeing the world for yourself. People naturally need to believe in something and identify with a group, but you can't surrender your complete identity as an individual. This is where the NPC meme comes from. For those that don't know, an NPC is non-player character in a video game. It's a character with a small amount of pre-programmed responses that the main character deals with. Totalitarians absolve responsibility to the group so their souls are eaten inside out. This is why totalitarianism always fails across history in every single guise in that it's designed to be an attempt to escape making critical, hard choices. This makes the totalitarians' actions a desperate attempt to maintain psychological stability, which means they push too far and then self-implode. The collection of people all trying to do this turns the whole movement into a toxic, irrational hurricane. People are at their worst in a mob. The West's immense success, as covered in these videos, in many ways stems from doing more to liberate the individual from the group, while at the same time being able to maintain moral standards. The second strategy is Epicureanism and Hedonism. 
Same as before, pleasure in small amounts makes life worth living. However, pure pleasure becomes an addiction, which is the cruelest thing in the world. We see this today where we have the best food, drink, porn, entertainment, and until recently sex, and about everything else available in history, but it just makes us more miserable. Think of sugar, which in moderation tastes wonderful, but when it becomes a habit, is an addiction that can ruin your health. In the single moment of pleasure, the Epicurean can be entranced by its intensity, thus forgetting death. We drink since it helps us forget the stress of the rest of our day. However, with too much, it becomes a new baseline and your life becomes a hedonic treadmill of purely trying to avoid thinking about anything bigger when the addiction wears off. Degeneracy literally results in degenerating, in which you lose your potential and good qualities in the search for fleeting pleasures. Over the historic record, hedonism-based societies lose everything that makes life in the long term worthwhile, like family, shared community, strong nation, religion, and everything else that extends beyond our puny deaths. After this comes nihilism, one that I can personally identify with, and a big reason I started this YouTube channel is I just wanted something that I could look at and be proud of that I brought into the world. Nihilism starts with the implicit belief that if you have low expectations, that's safer. However, we humans can't make rational leaps like that and then expect our actual minds to follow. Low expectations just turn into hatred of life itself for not supplying us with what we need. The final extension of nihilism is an active hatred of everything. Not the passive apathy that most nihilists claim. This is how you get school shooters or Nazis. Once you remove meaning, people turn vengeful to make the things that rejected them pay attention to them somehow. Humiliation results in turning against the previous hierarchy so that you could possibly destroy it and create a new one. Nihilism proves the belief in ego and soul. If we were purely creatures and mechanical things based off Darwinistic selection, suicide would never happen. However, with us as real creatures with feelings and hearts, sometimes life gets too hard and the ego falls apart. We have naturally ingrained expectations like love, food, reproduction, meaning, freedom, beauty, and safety that if not met, make life very hard, often nearly unbearable. The final way is heroism. Heroes take many forms, and just looking at stories, you can see everything between Cinderella, Hercules, Jack the Giant Slayer, Moses, the Little Mermaid, or Atalanta. The only thing they share is they took risks to do something worthwhile with their lives. This is the way of heroism, of taking responsibility for your own life to do the greatest thing possible. The way of heroism isn't easy. The responsibility is very difficult, but once you realize all the other options don't really work, you have to take it up. Think of Moses who didn't want to do God's mission, but reluctantly did so since he knew he could not bear a life without serving and when one in which his people were in bondage. However, the other personalities hate the hero since he is the symbol of everything they lack. This is why people hate Elon Musk, why the successful are always envied, or why Jesus was crucified on the cross. We'll get to this point later in this video, but our society is simultaneously pushing all three of the other strategies against the hero. The greatest feeling of our society is our inability to deal with death. This channel goes through so many of society's failings, but I think this is the fundamentally worst and most primal one. I believe that every other failing in our society stems from it in some regard. Let's look through each of the ways you can positively deal with death. Our birth rate's not sustainable. The intact family is completely broke down in our society. We have the lowest religiosity rates ever in history. The average person has no pride and is an anonymous drone. We don't have any pageantry where we all wear the same t-shirts, live in boxes and apartment buildings, and we work for giant corporations that don't care about us at all. We're actively trying to destroy our own culture and society. We don't really have any ways to play between people in real life, and we don't even let kids play outside or have recess anymore. At the same time, your average person has fewer friends than ever and no community at all. Our culture actively encourages Epicureanism, nihilism, and totalitarianism while hating heroism. The left has become a cult that runs almost all of society's institutions. Our culture pushes a culture of hedonism through advertising and commercialism and gives no value or community for people to believe in, so nihilism ends up filling the void. Heroism is considered toxic masculinity. We are a gaping, oozing hole of lack of the ability to deal with death, which has turned our society suicidal. 
The problem is that the vision of reality and humanity our culture is built off is just wrong. We had a blank slate or that people can be programmed by their societies to believe and enjoy anything they're told to. However, the reality is that we're animals programmed from birth for certain circumstances who need things to believe in to nourish our souls. With every element in our society, it was designed to please our baser desires like wealth and comfort, but totally ignored our higher ones like love, meaning, belonging, and truth. Once you realize how flawed the material view of life is, it suddenly makes you realize how people who lived much materially worse lives than us were able to thrive for thousands of years. The Indian peasant didn't have our comfort, but they did have family, community, religion, culture, and some kinds of play. They also didn't know what they were missing materially. I'm not saying that their lives were immeasurably better, but their culture was sustainable and ours is falling apart at the seams only decades after it was founded. McGill Christ in his book, The Master and His Emissary, talks about how we are divided between the right and left brain. The right brain's the emissary, and we can see the whole truth consistently gets the correct answer when tested, and can see the world as a holistic, whole, original, beautiful, and meaningful. The left brain, meanwhile, believes itself to always be correct, but when tested, is consistently wrong and only capable of seeing half the truth. It views the world as boring, mechanical, meaningless, and constructs everything through logical systems, whether or not they're correct. Can you guess which of these systems dominates the world today? The left brain is completely terrified of death since it's out of our control. Thus, modern society is a conspiracy to totally avoid death. We keep our societies so sterile they cause allergies. Most people never see death or birth until they have an actual kid, which is all kept in hospitals. The left brain's untempered fear of death has polluted every level of our society. Where parents are scared to let their kids play outside, and people are paralyzed by the infinitesimally small chance of a shark or terrorist attack. As I talk about in this video, we are ruled by the emotion anxiety today. This leads back to the beginning of the video. The reason young people today are incapable of doing anything with confidence, whether making a phone call, having people disagree with them, being criticized, or saying they like someone else, is because our culture only cares about money and power, and thus death is completely unbearable because there are no techniques to deal with it. Death anxiety is crippling us and we will continue to kill our society until we do something about it. As said before, all sweetness in life comes from death. The reason our society is completely incapable of making good art is our inability to come to terms with death. Modern stories have no stakes, originality, or beauty, since they don't come from a worldview with boundaries as they are made by totalitarian, nihilistic epicureans who hate heroism. <laughs> our culture is obsessed with technology, thinking it will save us from death. I'm sure lots of people in this audience think some breakthrough will magically extend their lifetimes to centuries. This is a false hope and has been seen wrong so many times in history by power-hungry emperors like Caligula or Qi Shi Huangdi. However, our entire society today acts like a power-hungry tyrant. People think irrationally about life extensions as it's entirely normal within human nature to do so. The universe's first law of life is death. Its nature will do anything to stop us from beating death, thus rendering it impossible. At the same time, with the mass aging that's going to go on over the next few decades, we won't want to extend lifetimes without youths. Extending youth involves so many factors as to make it basically impossible. A lot of science thinks that after a certain point, your body just wants you to die and will keep finding illnesses until you do so. Death gives life its dynamism. Imagine a society where your boss is a Victorian and it's another 50 years until he retires. The inability to deal with death comes through mental illness. Thus, it's no surprise that we have the highest rates of mental illness ever in history now. A quarter of Americans and Brits have a diagnosed mental illness and 40% of Gen Z does. I think these are lowball numbers given lots of people have mental illnesses that they don't know about themselves or haven't been diagnosed. I mean, every single girl I've met at the age of 25 has a serious mental illness. As said before, life is a farce and you can choose to view it as wonderful or terrible depending on how you want to look at it. There are eras of history far worse physically than ours with much better mental illness. I literally cannot find a single parallel ever to the current mental illness pandemic. It's normal for in secular cycles that I talk about in these videos in which we're currently going through for the world's population to have over a few decades. That's going to happen in our near future from the current demographic data since there are so few births. Rather than having a plague or wars like in traditional secular cycles, the population decline will come since two many people will be too mentally ill to procreate. 
The different mental illnesses are different tricks the mind plays to keep the ego alive when death is unbearable. Split personality and schizophrenia is when your mind splits off the traumatic parts to keep the rest of your ego safe. Anxiety keeps you away from potentially dangerous things, and depression's the same thing. I have PTSD, which is what happens when the natural mental defense mechanisms against chaos become turned up too high, causing lots of stress. The Indian writer Tagore said you can either let the truth into your home or it will burn it down. That's the case with death. We've unhealthily tried to keep death as far away as possible, but now we're going to see a lot of it. In almost all the world, we will either see mass aging without enough young people to support the society, which will create horrific choices about just not having enough money to keep granny alive. At the same time, the modern world's overextended supply chains will cause famine in most of the third world. War and plagues aren't givens, but they're definitely plausible. If our culture wants to survive this plague, we need to start doing the things that protect us against the fear of death. We should return to community, religion, family, nation, local business, personal rather than bureaucratic structures, and push heroism. However, as we all have to live through the mental health equivalent of the Black Death, Keep your wits and know that the world around you is crazy, not the other way around. This reminds me of this fascinating chart, which talks about the stages of life that conservatives versus progressives care about. For conservatives today, they put a heavier emphasis upon their families, their local communities, and their nations, which I think is reasonable because those are the things you can actually influence as an individual. Meanwhile, for progressives, they care more about all human life, all sentient life, and everything beyond that, which is impossible unless you are a god to influence and is a way of abdicating any sense of influence or responsibility in your individual life. Life exists through paradox. In many ways, the best way to deal with death is to not take it too seriously. I know what I just said is contrary to the entire human condition, but we know from the greatest figures in history that it's possible. Where I grew up, we had fireflies. There were little bugs that would go out in the night and make these beautiful little flashing lights. And at our heart, we're fireflies. No matter how high you go, no matter how great, you'll just be a firefly that went a little bit higher than the rest. Being that small might be terrifying, but at the same time, fireflies are absolutely beautiful. And even if you completely fail, since your life is so small, it means that everything is going to be okay. The greatest figures in history didn't fear death. Socrates, Jesus, Gandhi, and the like were able to face it, and they knew that they were part of a beautiful mosaic, that whether or not they lived was still everything and the most meaningful thing in the world. If they didn't fear death, I know it's an option for the rest of us not to either.